Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video and the next couple of videos, we're going to be looking at the anterior neck musculature. And what we're going to see is that this musculature is divided into four layers. We're going to begin by looking at the deep layer, and then after that we're going to see the intermediate layer. Superficial of that would be the hyoid layer, and then superficial to that would be just the superficial layer. In this video, we're going to look at both the deep layer and the intermediate layer. So let's take a look at this picture over here. Let's orient ourselves with it. So this right here is an anterior view of the cervical spine. This bone right here, this is the C1 vertebra, or atlas. Below that, we have the C2 vertebra, or axis. Okay. Down here, this is actually rib number one. Okay on the patient's left side. Over here would be rib number one on the patient's right, and situated directly above that are the clavicles. Okay. Up here is, of course, the skull. However, the anterior half of the skull has been removed for clarity, since the anterior half of it is going to contain the maxilla and mandible, and that would, of course, block our view of some of these superior muscles. So this part of the skull that remains is really the posterior half, uh, but don't really concern yourself that much with that. Okay, Skulls up here, we're looking at an anterior view. So over here, where my mouse is, would be the patient's left. Over here would be the patient's right. Now the first thing we can see is actually the anterior longitudinal ligament, or ALL. That's this thick, broad, ligamentous sheet that goes all the way down from the frame and magnum through over the anterior surface of the bodies of all of these vertebrae, and it'll actually extend all the way down to the sacrum. So that's our ALL. The first muscle shown over here, there's actually one over here on the left, one on the right, this is rectus capitis anterior. This muscle is actually the analog of a couple muscles that we saw in the suboccipital region on the posterior aspect. Those were the rectus capitis posterior major and minor. So that's this muscle right here. Its origin is on the atlas or the C1 vertebra. We see the origin is actually the inferior attachment. And then the insertion is the superior attachment up here on the occiput or occipital bone. Its blood supply is via the ascending artery, and it's innervated by the ventral rami of cervical nerves C1 and C2. And its action is going to be to perform neck flexion and also stabilize the atlanto-occipital joint. Okay? So when both of these rectus capitis anterior muscles contract in unison, it's going to pull the superior insertion toward the inferior origin, so it's going to pull the occiput down toward the atlas, and you're going to get neck flexion. Okay, So that's the function of these. Now, these muscles will be synergistic with the sternocleidomastoid that we're going to see much later. That's actually in the superficial region of the anterior neck. Okay, These are not the major neck flexors, but they do contribute. Okay, The second muscle is the rectus capitis lateralis. Those muscles are each lateral to the corresponding rectus capitis anterior. So here would be the patient's left rectus capitis lateralis. This one over here would be the patient's right rectus capitis lateralis. These muscles are actually the analogs of the obliquus capitis superior that we saw on the posterior side, again in the suboccipital region. Now this muscle, rectus capitis lateralis, has its origin on the transverse process of the atlas. Again, here's our atlas bone. Here's the transverse process on the left side. That's its origin or inferior attachment. The insertion is the superior attachment. This part of the occipital bone is what we call the jugular process. But again, it generally inserts on the occiput lateral to the insertion of the rectus capitis anterior. Now, in terms of the action of rectus capitis lateralis, let's suppose the left muscle over here contracted. So the right does not only the left. That's going to facilitate lateral flexion of the neck to the left. In other words, you're going to bend the head laterally toward the left. And in that movement, we would also see some other muscles active. One of them, again, that I'll mention is the analog of this muscle, the obliquus capitis superior, which was in the suboccipital region. Recall that that muscle, along with this one, actually facilitate ipsilateral neck lateral flexion. 
if the right rectus capitis lateralis contracted, it would facilitate right neck lateral flexion and would also co-contract with the right obliquus capitis superior on the posterior side. And this muscle also is going to be innervated by the ventral rami of, of cervical nerve C1 and C2, just like the rectus capitis anterior. The third muscle we're going to be looking at is one called longus colli, and that's this series of muscles that go all the way from the atlas all the way down into some of the thoracic vertebrae. And the longus colli is divided into three regions. We have the superior oblique, vertical intermediate, and the inferior oblique. And depending on which region you're talking about, the origins and insertions are going to change. Okay? So let's talk about the superior oblique first. That's this set of muscles right here. Notice that they run obliquely. They're running at a slight angle. Okay? And of course, they're the highest up, so they're superior oblique. In general, this one is actually going to have its origin on the transverse processes of C3, C4, and C5. So if we look here, this is actually C1, C2. Notice this one has its origin right here on the transverse process of C3. We have another one with its origin on the transverse process of C4. And then we see another one with its origin on the transverse process of C5 right here. These fibers run upward, and you can see that they're actually going to insert on the atlas right here. In fact, if we're being very specific, they're actually inserting on the anterior arch of the atlas. So that's your superior oblique part. The second component of the longus colli muscle is the vertical intermediate part. So these fibers on average run vertically. And regardless of whether or not we start at the superior part or the inferior part of this, we do see that they bulge out laterally a little bit as they get to their middle, but then they converge back medially on the spine. But overall, they're more or less vertical when we compare them to the superior or inferior oblique parts. Now, when we look at the origin of this part of the longus colli, this is actually going to be on the anterior bodies of the T1 through T3 vertebrae. So if we actually look at this one, its origin is actually at the bottom. And so what we see is that here's one origin right here. But in general, they're going to originate on the bodies, that is anteriorly, of T1 through T3. If we follow these fibers upward, yes, medially they bulge out a little bit, but they're going to converge back, and they're actually going to insert on the bodies, anteriorly, of C2 through C4. So this bone right here, this is of course C1, the atlas, here's the axis. We actually see the top part of the vertical intermediate component is actually inserting on the anterior part of the C2 body, and then there would be three more components, one inserting on the body of C3, and then another one inserting on the body of C4. Okay, The third and last component of the longus colli muscle is the inferior oblique part. This is actually the smallest component of the muscle, and if we actually look at this, we see that its major fiber is actually running right here. Okay, Now this one is going to have its inferior attachment down here roughly on the anterior body of the T3 vertebra, it's going to ascend and move laterally and have its superior attachment on the anterior tubercle of the transverse process of C5. Again, if we zoom out a little bit, this is C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. So actually notice that the inferior oblique part actually has its superior attachment on the anterior tubercle of the C5 transverse process, whereas for the superior oblique part, the actual lowest one, the lowest set of fibers, actually has its inferior attachment on that anterior tubercle of the transverse process of C5. So that's your longus colli muscle. The innervation of the longus colli is going to be mainly through the ventral rami of the C2 through C6 spinal nerves. Now there is some muscular fibers down here lower than where we'd find the C6 spinal nerve, so there is going to be some other innervation, but the bulk of this muscle is between C2 and C6, and so this is going to be the majority of the contribution to that innervation. 
and the action of the longus cully muscle is going to be neck flexion. So, of course, we only see the right longus cully. There would be one on the left as well. And when they both contract at the same time, you get neck flexion. Now, this is more or less going to assist in that. The primary neck flexor is going to be the sternocleidomastoid, but this is also going to provide some of that force to flex the neck. So these three muscles comprise the deep layer of the anterior neck. These are the three deepest muscles. We're now going to switch gears and look at one layer superficial to this. Okay? It's not the most superficial, it's just superficial to this, and that's the intermediate layer. We're going to see two major muscles here. We're going to see the scalenes, which is really more of a group of muscles, and then we're also going to see the longus capitis. Those are the two muscles in the intermediate layer. We're going to begin by looking at the scalenes. Now the scalenes are more of a group of muscles. That's because we have anterior, middle, and posterior scalenes. Collectively, these muscles are going to originate on transverse processes of some of the cervical vertebrae from C2 down to C7. Now we're going to begin by looking at the posterior scalenes. And so if we look at these, these muscles right here, we see that they're actually going to begin their origins on the C4 transverse process. So this bone up here, this is C1, here's C2, C3, and C4. If you look really carefully, here we have an origin on the C4 transverse process, one on C5, and then one here on C6. Okay, So that's where they're going to originate, and they're going to descend downward and insert on the second rib. Okay. All three of the scalenes, anterior, middle, and posterior, all insert on a rib. However, the posterior scalene is the only one that's going to insert on rib two. Okay? We can't really see the insertion too well here, but notice that this rib right here in my mouse is, this is actually rib one. We clearly do not see the posterior scalenes inserting on that bone. They're actually going to insert a little bit farther down on rib two. Okay? Now let's take a look at the middle scalenes. So notice from this picture to this one, I've added in the middle scalenes. They now cover up the posterior scalenes. So they're actually anterior to the posterior scalenes, which makes sense. Right? So these are also going to originate on transverse processes. However, they're going to originate a little bit farther up. Again, this was the C1 bone, atlas. Here's C2, and we actually see the origin of the middle scalenes beginning on the transverse process of C2, the axis. We see another one here on C3, C4, C5. There appears to be another one right here on C6. So these originate on C2 through C6. Right? Again, the fibers are going to descend downward, but this time middle scalenes are going to insert on the first rib, or rib number one. And we're actually going to see that pattern follow with the anterior scalenes. All right. Now before I add in the anterior scalenes, what I want to mention is that we have the middle scalenes right here. I'm about to add in the anterior scalenes, but there's going to be a little space right here okay, between the middle scalenes and the anterior scalenes. This space is called the interscalene space, and it's applicable because actually the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery are actually going to move through this space. They're actually going to move between the middle scalenes and anterior scalenes. Okay? We'll come back to that a lot later and when we start talking about the brachial plexus and other things. So here's the anterior scalenes. Now the longus capitis is covering up the origins a little bit, but actually if we look at this, we notice here's the most lateral and most superior of all these fibers of the anterior scalenes you notice that it actually doesn't go up as high as what we saw in the middle scalenes. So the middle scalenes actually originate up the highest at C2. The anterior scalenes in general really start originating off of the transverse processes of C4. And we see there's one for C5, C6, and then one for C7. Okay? Again, the fibers descend downward, and like the middle scalenes, they're also going to insert on the first rib or rib number one. Okay? Now in general, the scalenes really work together to elevate the ribs, that is ribs one and two. So for example, the actions of the anterior and middle scalenes, since they insert on the first rib, they're going to elevate the first rib. 
In contrast, because the posterior scalenes insert on rib two, they're gonna elevate rib two. So collectively, the scalenes elevate the first and second ribs. So collectively, the scalenes elevate the first two ribs. They also participate in lateral neck flexion, assuming only one side of these contracts. So for example, these scalenes over here, anterior, middle, and posterior, these are the right scalenes, because it's on the right side of the body. If the right scalenes were to contract and the left, which are not shown, did not contract, then what would happen is we'd have the head bend toward the right in the lateral direction, okay? So it's like putting your ear to your shoulder, right? It's lateral flexion. And that's ipsilateral, lateral neck flexion, because when the right side contracted, we bend the head toward the right. The scalenes are going to be innervated by the ventral rami from the C3 through the C8 spinal nerves. Okay? One more thing about the actions of these muscles. Because they're able to elevate the first and second ribs, they're going to play a role in forced or active inspiration. So when we're doing quiet inspiration, so breathing in just at rest, we don't require these muscles. That's just going to be the thoracic diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. However, if we start exercising or having to actively breathe in, forcefully breathe in, we may have to activate the scalenes. And by elevating the first and second ribs, so bringing them upward, it serves to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, which facilitates increase in the volume of the lungs and getting more air into the lungs. So hopefully that makes sense. The second muscle in the intermediate layer of the anterior neck is the longus capitis, which is shown right here. Notice the longus capitis goes all the way up to the skull, to the occiput, but also notice it's anterior to the anterior scalenes. So all three of the scalenes lie behind the longus capitis. This is the most anterior in this layer. Now for the longus capitis, its inferior attachment down here is actually the origin. So the fibers actually ascend vertically to the insertion up here. So the origin down here is going to be the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C3 through C6. Now this vertebra right here, this is the C6 vertebra, so we're seeing uh, the C6 origin. Technically, there's also origins at the transverse processes of C5, 4, and 3. However, those are a little bit less prominent, and they're covered up by the muscular part here. Okay? The most prominent is going to be that of the anterior tubercle of the transverse process of C6. Now, the fibers are going to ascend vertically up to the occiput, so the insertion is going to be all the way up here. And in general, the insertion is just the occip occipital bone or occiput. The innervation to this muscle is going to be through the C1 through C4 ventral rami. Okay? So that's because this muscle ascends all the way up to the skull. It's going to have to be the higher ventral rami, C1 through C4. And the action of the longus capitis is going to be neck flexion. Now again, remember that there's one on the right side here as shown, but also one on the left side that we can't see. And so when these two muscles contract, you're going to get neck flexion. So it's going to pull the insertion down toward the occiput, which is going to bring your chin basically toward your manubrium of your sternum, neck flexion, right? And it's going to do this at the atlanto-occipital joint because that's where we have the majority of our range of motion of neck flexion, okay? So these muscles right here, longus capitis, are also going to be synergistic with the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Sternocleidomastoid is going to be the major neck flexor, but these are also going to assist in that. These are just a lot deeper. And we're going to cover the sternocleidomastoid in a lot more detail when we look at the superficial layer in one of the next two videos. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the deep and intermediate layers of the anterior neck. In the next video, we're going to do a very brief review of this material, very brief, and then we're going to move into talking about the hyoid muscles. Join us then. Thank you.